So uh, I, you may have already noticed a bit of a French accent into my speech, right? That means I haven't grown up here in Jasper. I actually grew up on the east coast of Canada in New Brunswick. Everybody knows where that is? Yeah. Perfect. So uh, I was over there uh, living in New Brunswick and when I was 18 years old, uh, I went and traveled, traveled to Europe and that's how I ended up here in the Rockies. <laughs> What happened when I was over there is that uh, when I would tell people that I was Canadian, they right away wanted to know about the Rockies. Uh, I had no idea. I had never been here. And so I figured I should visit my own country a little more before I went traveling other places. Good for you. Thanks. So I, uh, I ended up here in Jasper. My first uh, place in the Rockies was here. I had a job at the Fairmont Hotel. Actually, it was pretty good. I had the most glorious job of all. I was cleaning the kitchens at night. <laughs> It gave me a wonderful opportunity to be able to uh, take the, enjoy the outdoors. You know, I got into the sports that people do here, like mountain biking, rock climbing, uh, skiing and snowboarding and all these things. And uh, so it was really good, but uh, I wanted to explore a little further. So I did move around a lot uh, through British Columbia and Alberta. And of course, sometimes I went back home. It was so hard to be away from the family. Uh, but what happened is over the last 20 some years, I've moved back to Jasper five times now. It keeps calling me back. There's something special here. Now, something even better happened 10 years ago. I got my first guiding job. It was actually on Milling Lake doing the boat cruise. Wonderful place. I really enjoyed to be able to show people nature and help them appreciate it and connect with it a little more. And so uh, I wanted to do this, but uh, what happened uh, in October? Uh, we get laid off because the lake freezes in the winter, right? And so I was out of a job. Now I wanted to keep guiding and I was fortunate that my friends owned and operated a uh, Moline Canyon ice walk. And so what that is, maybe you've seen the Moline Canyon today, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful place, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now uh, you've probably never imagined how it looks in the wintertime, so I've brought you a picture of what it looks like. And so from December till April, uh, this will freeze safely enough, uh, we can do a walk inside the canyon. And so I did those for eight years in the wintertime. Uh, probably accumulated about 1,000 ice walks in those eight years. I enjoyed every one of them. So uh, the hiking aspect of guiding is what I appreciated and I wanted to keep going with that. And so I took my courses through the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides to become a full hiking guide. Uh, what that enables me to do is uh, walks in the valleys, hikes all the way up to the tops of the mountains, and overnight backpacking trips where we carry our tents, stove, and I cook for everyone and the whole deal. Yeah, so it's pretty good. And uh, over the last four years, it's been my own company as well with a partner and uh, things are going quite well. Yeah, thanks. And of course, we learn about the wildlife sometimes firsthand and then sometimes, uh, you know, we study the wildlife as well. So through the Interpretive Guides Association, I've taken some courses to be as accurate as I can while passing this information along. And so we'll go through some of the animals that we have here in Jasper and I'll test you out at the same time, see how much you've been learning. <laughs> so this animal here would be uh, which one? Elk. That's right. So what's the other name for elk? Wapiti. Good, you've been learning pretty good. And now what does Wapiti mean? White, white rump. White rump, that's <laughs> right. Good, you've been listening. And so uh, that's the white rump and you've noticed that, eh? And uh, only the male will carry these antlers here. Now, uh, why would they go through so much trouble of growing a bigger set of antlers every year, trying to make the biggest set? Well, it's for the girlfriends, of course. <laughs> and so they're going to try to grow them through the summer. It'll start in the springtime. They'll eat as much as they can. Uh, at the height of the growing season, it can be over an inch a day that it'll grow. That's pretty impressive. The nerve endings are what's going to help it to grow like that. Now often I get the question, why, like, how did they have so much calcium in their food? It's actually that they store the calcium inside their rib cage, And then when it's needed for the antlers, it'll be spread through that part of their body. And uh, so these antlers will grow not necessarily by how old the animals are, but also by how healthy they are. So the more they eat, of course it only makes sense that they'll be able to grow the biggest sets. Now that is to be able to grow uh, the biggest sets to battle against the other males and so that they can uh, win the harem of females. And so can you imagine every guy here, the stress of having 25 girlfriends at once. <laughs> I think it'd be a little challenging for sure. And so for him, he has to battle against the other males. He barely sleeps and barely eats for the whole time. 
Uh, that happens for about a couple of weeks, uh, he'll be a little bit worried about his female group. Uh, no human should go close either, because he'll think that you're challenging him, challenging him for his females. And so, uh, of course, after all that exercise as well, uh, winter comes along, and then uh, it's hard for them to recover. Getting the food is a little bit more work, and it's less nutritious at, as well in the wintertime. And so the elk that will have successfully mated will often be the one that will pass away that winter. Of course, the wolves, when they hunt in packs uh, in the wintertime, they're going to go after the weakest one and single him out. And so it often is the one that will have successfully mated that will pass away that winter. Oh, it sounds sad, doesn't it? But it's okay, because he dies with a smile. <laughs> He's achieved his lifetime goal, and then, uh, you know, it's also good for the diversity of the gene. And so the females, when they give birth in the springtime, uh, they'll, uh, you know, be, be very, very careful with their calves. Uh, they're going to hide them in the shrubs. They're only going to go there to feed them. And then they'll come, you know, after a couple of weeks, then they're a little stronger and they're able to run away from the predators. It is a difficult time for any species for the first year, right? And so the population of elk is stable in Jasper, about 500. And, uh, but, you know, about one third of all the calves that are born in that summer uh, will pass away. And also one more third will pass away the first winter. Winter. So that's part of the whole process. And so uh, we'll see them fairly often in the valleys here. As well, we'll often see uh, the deer that we have around. Let me change antlers here. So we have two types of deer around here. Do, we, do you know which type? Okay, so yeah, this is the white-tailed deer here and mule deer. The difference between the two antlers is that there's a fork inside the tine of the mule deer. And so you'll probably not remember that too long, right? Uh, the white-tailed deer has a white tail and the mule deer has uh, big ears, just like the mules. That's why they were named like that. Now, like this is the third animal that I've just talked about that has a white rump. Uh, like the wapitsi, these ones have a white rump as well. Uh, the mule deer has a little black tip at the end of the tail. That's the main difference. Uh, we'll see the uh, animals around here as well. They live in the, in the valleys, sometimes going up higher in the summer times near Malane Lake, and then coming all the way back to the town side of Jasper in the, in the winters. And so why would they have a white rump like uh, so many animals like this? Uh, it always has a purpose in nature. And so white rumps, uh, you know, if they're getting chased by their predators in the wintertime, uh, they're going to want to stick together, not get singled out. Of course, it can be dark at night. And so if they have white rump, they can follow each other. They don't have headlights. <laughs> and so you can use this uh, good trick, you know, you can walk around here at night. It can be dark sometimes, so just drop your pants and you can follow each other this way. <laughs> <laughs> You might get in trouble, or maybe not. <laughs> and so uh, the, uh, <laughs> the deer, uh, we'll see them fairly often. The white-tailed deer will run away a little bit more often than the mule deer. Uh, actually, these antlers here, the ones that haven't been treated, uh, were donated by a taxidermist in Edmonton. The ones that have been treated came from uh, my father. He's been a hunter my whole life, and so when I tried to gather a whole set, uh, he was the one who uh, donated some of these antlers. So I'm very thankful to him for all that. Which ca animal carries these? That's right. So this one also came from my father's collection. In New Brunswick, there is a lot of moose hunting, a lot of marshy areas. And so my whole life, I've seen uh, moose uh, habitat. Now it is usually in the marshy areas. That's where like, they like to be because they like to eat the vegetation at the bottom. Now coming back to this antler, it has a palm-like structure. Now why would this animal have such a heavy palm-like structure? Well, it is right next to their ears. And because they live a solitary life away from the females, in the fall when she's calling for uh, the mating time, she decides when it's mating time, uh, he'll come running. And from about a mile and a half away, two kilometers, he'll be able to hear the female calling. Uh, these little radars right next to their ears will uh, bounce the sound waves right into their ears. So during the mating time, it's important to listen for what she's saying. The rest of the year, they just turn the ear and don't listen to what she's saying. Typical male. Yeah, typical male. Eh? And so, uh, they, uh, 
they all lose their antlers. You know, these are all the same uh, situation. They're all calcium, uh, basically bone structures that will fall off every year. And so there is a fair amount of these different animals and with lots of antlers shedding through the forest, that means that we should be able to find these antlers all over. But we don't actually because uh, small mammals and rodents will eat these. And of course, in the national park, uh, you should never pick anything like this. Uh, it's good to leave everything there, right? So uh, the moose hunting call is how they do it. Uh, you know, uh, they go up in the trees and then from there they'll do the moose call. Now, my father, after the moose hunt, they would often get together and show the size of antlers and animals that they've caught. And sometimes they would get the kids together uh, to see who would do the best moose call. And actually, I entered that competition when I was five years old and I won first place. I, sh I should probably be honest with you that there was only two of us in the competition. <laughs> My father, when he heard that I was uh, demonstrating all this stuff, uh, he thought I should have one of his authentic moose calling device made by the natives in New Brunswick. And so he'd used this device himself for many, many years. And so uh, he gave me one of his uh, when I wanted one. And uh, it's okay, he doesn't need it anymore. He cheats. Uh, he uses these electronic devices now. So. So this is basically made out of birch bark. It just amplifies the sound that I make in my throat when I'm doing the call, right? So that's good. Oh, no, I can't do the call right now. This is the highlight of my talk. I will do it at the end, though. Don't worry, I'll, I won't forget. Yeah, and that, that way there nobody leaves now. It works pretty good, that trick. I will not forget to do it, though. Um, we'll come back to the moose at the end. So uh, which animal would carry these antlers here? Caribou. Yeah, that's right. So this one also came from my father's collection. Uh, he had only hunted moose once in his whole life in Newfoundland. And so this was probably displayed in his camp for many, many years. And when I tried to gather the whole set, I knew he had one of these. And I wanted this one. It took me one week of trying to convince him before he said yes. So I was very grateful for this one. And so. Um, the caribou is a little bit unique. Uh, the ones that we have here, for example, uh, they don't do the huge migrations like the caribou way up north. Uh, here they just go within the alpine meadows up high uh, and then within tree line in the wintertime. They'll eat the lichen on the trees and different areas like that. So we don't see them very often for their habitat location, but they're also quite elusive. The numbers are pretty small too. There's only 125 caribou left in the national park. They're divided in four different herds, some being four or six in the whole herd. And so it's not going too well. Parks Canada, they're doing everything they can to try to reestablish this uh, by doing some protected areas in the wintertime especially. They figure that if we don't do ski tracks up into the mountains, then the wolves will not have the easiest access to the wolves' uh, caribou's habitat. Hopefully this will work. It is uh, difficult for people who like backcountry skiing uh, to lose these areas, but uh, it's definitely worth it if it helps with the caribou. Uh, the caribou is only mate every three years, so it will be a slow process. I've heard that, uh, talks that they might uh, do some breeding and maybe try to reintroduce some. We'll see if that helps and if it works. Now, both the male and the females will grow these antlers here. And so uh, through the summer, uh, the female will grow them and actually keep the antlers over the whole winter. The male, it'll be like the other antlers, uh, other males, that they'll drop it off after the rutting season in the fall. So uh, the female antlers are just a little bit smaller than the males. Uh, this might have been a young male or a, a female as well. My father didn't actually remember if it was a male or female that he'd caught. Another thing that's interesting about the caribou antlers is that uh, when they fall, they go rubbery, it c they, they can actually eat their own antlers to uh, reuse the calcium. It's a pretty neat process. And so through all the hiking that I've done in the national park here, only once have I ever seen the caribou, a female and her calf in the, the Tonquin Valley, just over those mountains over there. So that was pretty special to see them. So uh, now we're going to switch over to a different type of animal, bighorn sheep, that's right, bighorn sheep. So this is not a, a, an antler, it's a horn, so it will not fall off every year. It keeps growing through their whole life. And so the deepest rings of this animal on the, on the horn, this is one year of their life. So just like the rings on the tree, you can count about how old this animal would have been when it passed away. 
And so it was very difficult to find one of these horns because you don't find them all over the forest, right? They don't fall off every year. And so Parks Canada was nice enough to lend me one of these so that I can do these talks. Uh, it took me a while to actually find the right person to, to get this. At first I'd gotten one from the museum and so uh, they, when they sent me an email saying that they had a big horn sheep's horn, uh, I was pretty happy but then when I got there, this is all they had for me. <laughs> so, it's pretty hard to convince people that this came from a big horn sheep, right? But now that I have both, it's actually really handy because I can take them like this and show you how much has worn off. So this is all broken off at the tip here. And if you line them up by size, you can see how much will get worn off through their years of battling and uh, whatever else they're doing when they're... Uh, so uh, the way that this grows, you know, uh, there's a, a honeycomb structure of bone that will hold this in there. And so that helps to absorb the shock. Now these animals, when they battle against the other males, they are the fiercest battles. Uh, just like the elk, they're going to try to gather as many females as they can and so that they can mate with all of them at the same time. Now, the way they do it is they'll back off, uh, back up about 30 or 40 feet and then they're going to ram their heads as hard as they can, back up again and do it again. Now, if you can imagine, these battles can last up to 25 hours. Now, that is determination to pass on your genes. <laughs> Uh, so it is uh, definitely a, a big battle. Uh, they will not die from this battle, but you know some will definitely get shaken up. So uh, I said that they don't fall off these horns, but it's not entirely impossible for them to fall off. With a really bad blow, it could happen. I heard a story from a warden once. They got a call from a trucker who thought he'd killed a bighorn sheep. And uh, when the warden looked for it, he actually couldn't find the sheep, but found a trace of blood into the, into the forest, into the woods. And so he actually found a sheep uh, with one horn missing. It was lodged into, into the truck, actually. So it's amazing the battle, uh, you know, the blow that they got, it still was able to survive that. So the male sheep uh, will only live maybe nine, 10 years of age, uh, a little more for the females. These uh, have a hard life. Now they don't use their horns to be able to battle against the other predators. Uh, they're gonna actually stay along the steepest cliffs. That's how they get away from the predators. And so you'll always see them close to the cliffs. Uh, in case the predator comes, they'll run right up. They're the most agile four-legged animals around. Uh, so another animal that could reach them though would be, do you know? Coming from the air, the eagles, yeah. The eagles would try to push them off and pick up the remains at the bottom. Uh, it can be a difficult life, of course, being the, the prey like this, but what happens then uh, in the wintertime when they're still on these steepest uh, cliffs, avalanches can happen also. Uh, it would be a difficult situation for them, but uh, everything happens for a reason in nature because when they get buried at the bottom of these avalanche slopes, the bears are going to go and, uh, and pick these animals that are buried underneath. Uh, when they come out of hibernation, they don't have any accessible food besides these buried sheep inside the snow. And so you'll often see a couple of bears at the bottom of the same slope uh, feeding on the sheep like that. And so that brings us to the smallest prop of the day. <laughs> so this is a claw from a, a black bear. That's right. So uh, I've only got the black bear claw right now. Uh, this is a short rounded about one inch long. Uh, the grizzly bear claw is about three or four inches long. And so that one there has a different purpose. They dig in the ground for hoary marmots for different roots and uh, Colombian ground squirrels as well. And so the bears, uh, the black bear has a short claw because it likes to climb the trees to get away from uh, the grizzly bear or other predators when they're cubs. And so it is pretty important for them to have that. Um, so I'm pretty happy as a hiking guide that there's uh, bears in the national park because that's often why I get hired. Uh, I'm pretty big and strong, so I can protect my guests, you know. <laughs> I don't know why you laugh every time I say that, but okay. <laughs> I am pretty strong. I'm not that big, but <laughs> so I do carry a bottle of bear spray and there's a holster that this goes in and I keep it on my hip all the time. That's a very important thing to do. Uh, just carrying a bear bell, for example, will, might warn the bears that you're coming but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't carry the bear spray as well. It's a really good tool to have. Traveling in numbers is also a very good idea because when you do this, then uh, you're a bigger animal and there is a very small chance if you're traveling in at least four or five people together that the bear will come close to you. Even if you just go walking behind here uh, along the rivers, the bears can be anywhere, right? So that's a really important aspect to do. 
So we have both the black bears and the grizzly bears around here. Uh, we'll see the black bears a little more often. Uh, while hiking though, I don't see them that often. It's mostly along the road when we're driving that we'll see the bears. And so that's a good thing. I've never had to use the bear spray and I'm glad I, I don't really want to use it either. Uh, it's a very effective tool, but if it's windy and the wind is in your face, you're the one getting the pepper spray in the face, right? <laughs> and so you got to be careful with that. And so uh, the bears... We saw two, two gray bears yes. along the highway. Yeah. Is that a, was that a, a brown bear or a black bear? Well, the grizzly bears will have more of a brown, brownish color. And then the black bears can vary a lot in different colors. So maybe you saw uh, a black bear that had a different color. We'll discuss a little more after the talk and we'll see maybe what you saw. Yeah. And so... Uh, the bears' uh, habits and what they do in the national park here is pretty interesting because we're in Alberta, uh, there's no salmon here. We're on the east side of the continental divide. And so since they don't have any salmon, they have to eat a lot of berries uh, through the summertime. So uh, gaining about 20,000 calories per day is pretty challenging when you're eating berries. <laughs> of course, they have other food as well, but that is the main part of their diet. And so uh, the buffalo berries is a high fat content berry and this year they're in really good season. Uh, the shrubs are about this high and they're loaded with berries. The, the grizzly bears can eat up to 200,000 berries in one day. Their bodies are basically a juicing machine. It won't digest the whole berry. It'll just squeeze out the juices and everything else comes out on the other end. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty interesting thing now. Uh, they'll go into hibernation in the fall. The female will already be pregnant. So they mate in mid-June and she will actually not be truly pregnant until she goes into hibernation. If she's healthy and fat enough, uh, she will actually get impregnated. Uh, she can be pregnant from multiple males at the same time. And so uh, it is kind of interesting how that happens because when uh, she's in the hibernation stage in late January, she'll give birth to two to three cubs, sometimes between one and five. And so these cubs are so fragile that if they would be in nature, they wouldn't be able to survive right yet. They're hairless, they're sightless, and so they wouldn't be able to do much against predators. But during the rest of the hibernation, they'll nurse on her for the rest of the time and gain. They'll go from about two pounds when they're born up to 10 pounds when they're ready to come out. So they'll have grown five times in size and then they'll be more ready to face the world and climb the trees when they need to. And so uh, we'll see the bears fairly often. And uh, you know, as soon as uh, we see them, if we make a little bit of noise, they usually move away. They're not there to attack us. And so it is fairly safe to be hiking in the, in the back country, especially when you make enough noise, right? And uh, so basically my closest encounter, I'll give you an idea. When I was uh, mountain biking with a friend, uh, we were sitting next to a lake and there was people on the other side <laughs> kept pointing at us or they, they kept waving at us. And after three times, I noticed that they weren't waving, but they were pointing upwards. And so there was a couple of cubs that were in the tree right next to us. So, uh, yeah, I didn't wait too long. <laughs> we got out of there and the female didn't come any closer. So that was a pretty good, uh, pretty good encounter, we'll say. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's do the moose call. So this is the female calling the male. Actually, while I was camping out once, uh, I was, uh, there was a female and her calf around and I really maybe didn't think about what I was doing too much because after a little while I thought I would demonstrate to my guests uh, how to do the moose call and, and see but uh, about 15 minutes later the male came running down the trail. <laughs> he thought it was early mating time. <laughs> it wasn't of course so she turned around and walked away and I could tell he was very disappointed. <laughs> Luckily he didn't turn on us. That's it. <laughs> yeah. This is not a moose, uh, you know, habitat here, so we don't ever have moose running down. Sometimes there's a girl that comes, but. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any questions at all? Anything I haven't answered? Yes. Uh, 
Uh, don't actually have any numbers for the population of cougars, uh, but they are around. Uh, we have uh, lynx, bobcats, and also uh, the cougars. And the other thing you didn't uh, point out was you also have uh, mountain goats here. Don't yes, we do. Yeah, it's true. And they live a little bit. Uh, mountain goats live in the same uh, lifestyle as the bighorn sheep. Uh, they're higher up in elevation, so we'll see them a little less than, than we'll see the bighorn. So the bighorn sheep, there's about 1,200 of them, which is a lot, and the uh, mountain goat's population is uh, 250, they believe. It's uh, not a high level of, uh, of confidence in that number, but yeah. Yes, sir? It's a big, black, white, and blue bird. Big, black, white... Magpie, yeah. Long tail, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's about 60 to 80 wolves in the national park, divided in about eight different uh, wolf packs. Yeah, we don't see them very often. They avoid us a lot. We'll see the coyotes more often around. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, that's pretty good. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and. Uh, now, um, I'll be staying here for a little while longer. If you want to come and lift up these antlers and uh, take some pictures with them, ask more questions, I'll be happy to answer anything you want. And uh, I don't recommend sparring with the antlers, though. That's probably not a good idea. <laughs> uh, you can have some marshmallows. And uh, if you've touched uh, marshmallows with your hands and they're all sticky, please don't touch the antlers afterwards. <laughs> And uh, when you're done with your stick, you can just stick it in the fire, rub it off on the side there, and uh, it'll be ready for the next person. So. Thank you very much, everyone.